Okay, hi everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for the Parent Resource Center May Lunch and Learn. Um, today's topic is going to feature anxiety and we're going to introduce our speaker in just a moment, but we just wanted to take a minute to let you meet the Parent Resource Center team. My name is Kathleen Donovan. I'm a special education coordinator here at the Parent Resource Center and I'm joined by my two wonderful colleagues and maybe I'll toss to Gina to say a quick hello. Sure. Hi there. I'm Gina Piccolini de Salvo. I'm so happy to be here with you today. Um, we also have our fabulous administrative assistant, Emma Peral Sanchez. Um, if you have any questions as we go, feel free to enter them in the chat, or if they are kind of a follow up question or more in depth question, if you want to shoot us an email um, at our email, it's in the chat, prc at apsba.us, or give us a call. We're at 703. 228-7239, and we'd be happy to set up a time to meet with you. Thanks, Emma. Would you like to just say a quick hello? And I, I don't think we had anybody who registered to speak, um, registered in Spanish, but Emma, if you want to say a quick hello in English and in Spanish, that would be great. Yes. Hello, everybody. Hola, ¿cómo están todos? Si hay alguien en español y están interesados en, es, en escuchar el, la plática en español, por decir, por favor, pónganos un comentario en el chat and hello again. Thank you, Emma. Okay, so a little bit about the Parent Resource Center. If you have not accessed our supports and services in the past, we are here to support families in partnering and collaborating with staff at our schools because we know that the more involved and engaged you are, the better your kids do in school. Um, we offer a lending library. We offer one-to-one -one consultations with parents by phone or video chat or here in person at our office. And then finally, we offer lots of learning sessions like today's. Um, so we are thrilled to, I'm not going to take up too much more time. I think Jean has put our contact information in the chat. So if you have questions about the PRC, let us know. Um, but I'd like to turn it over to one of our colleagues, um, Amy Canova is a school psychologist who graciously offered to talk about a topic I think that is very relevant, especially in these times, um, anxiety. So Amy, I'm going to turn it over to you and let you continue introducing yourself and everybody else. Thanks so much for coming. Sure, thanks for having me. So as mentioned, my name is Amy Canova. I'm one of the school psychologists here at Wakefield High School. This is my, I think it's my 19th or my 20th year in the profession. I'm nationally certified with a specialization in queer and trans youth. And I've been presenting on anxiety and stress for a number of years, partly because of necessity and partly because if you remember the commercial, I'm not just the president, I'm also a client that I kind of feel like that resonates with me too. So I'm a fairly informal presenter. I know you were asked to mute yourselves if you're not speaking. That said, if you have questions as you're going along, feel free to put them in the chat or just unmute yourself and ask questions because that's what we're here for. Um, before we get started, I wanna make sure everyone can see the screen. Um, in terms of the presentation, I will provide the presentation PowerPoint to the Parent Resource Center and they can share it with all participants because I presume they will have a list. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. I will say first and foremost that this is a presentation that I delivered to both students and staff with a few modifications because the reality is, is that at one point in time in our lives, everyone is going to experience anxiety, right? And whether we refer to it as stress or anxiety, we tend to interchange terms. And unfortunately, one of the fallacies of psychology as a profession is we use a diagnostic label to be the same as the symptoms that are associated with it. So someone that experiences anxiety might have a diagnosis of anxiety, and might have a symptom of anxiety, which is not really self-explanatory. So we're gonna talk about that as well as differences and distinctions and overlapping between them. I apologize in advance, it is spring. And as a result, I'm allergic to pretty much everything in the world. <laughs> so hopefully my voice lasts. I feel like I haven't had clear eyes or clear sinus cavity you know, in, in months, but we'll get through it. Are there any burning questions before we get started? All right, sounds good. 
or not. If you have a question, just call it out. We're good with that. All right, so be mindful of time. Today, we're gonna to talk about stress out, coping during COVID and beyond. And so obviously as a school psychologist, I run into students and parents and staff and friends and associates who are experienced stress and anxiety, but we know that during the pandemic, mental health concerns have just magnified to an exponential degree such that people are having difficulty receiving treatment for such because there's a difficulty with both insufficient number of providers in the area, low number of people that take insurance, and just the fact that what we have happened during times of increased stress is pre-existing difficulties are just magnified. And so we've seen a lot of that, as well as when people return from geographic isolation back into day-to-day -day life with lots of people, we've also seen a resurgence in symptomology. So let's talk about what's happening, right? We're gonna talk about what stress is. We're gonna talk about why students feel stress, how we respond to stress, the effects of stress, the difference between good stress and bad stress, stress versus anxiety, um, physical and emotional challenges associated with stress, coping skills, and stress management. As you can see in my picture, this is a pretty good description of the stress monster. All right, I'm gonna get us started with a video. This video is available on YouTube. So those of you who are familiar with Hallmark and Hoops and Yo-Yo might recognize some of these characters. And this is a video called Second Guest Thursday. And I will preface the video by recognizing the fact that stress is inevitable and it's a part of life. And what stresses one person out might be different what stresses another person out. And when we observe someone who's under stress, whether it's chronic or intermittent stress, many things happen and that can affect someone's difficulty to manage day-to-day -day life and activities that they normally do. And so you might mumble, you might be incoherent, et cetera. And so this video is not in any way intended to poke fun of how people respond to stress, but just to provide a characterization of what stress looks like from the perspective of an outside observer and what we might witness when someone is under stress. And so some of the things you might see might seem silly or funny or scary or perplexing, but realize to the person that's overwhelmed by stress, the anxiety they experience is very real. That is really quiet. I got this report. Let's make it louder. Buddy, do you, do you think it looks good? I I think it looks good. I spent a lot of time. I mean, I spent a lot, a lot of time on it. And you I all here? Research. And I think it's great, but I'm not sure. I wouldn't be sure of myself. Yes. I, I'm not sure. I don't know. I think it's good, but I'm not sure if they, they think it's good. Maybe you should have a focus group. Uh, they could tell you if, it, if it's good or not. I don't know I'm what really, I think either. I'm really nervous about it. I'm nervous and, for you. And, and I thought I would take it over oh. to her booth, but I didn't know if I should still put it near an office mail or, or if I should walk I it by or I, I should have the courier take it over. Oh, gosh, there's so many decisions. I, and I, I, I mean... Maybe and then should, I thought, you know, should I staple the papers together or should I use a paper clip? Or lick them. Or should I put it like an air office mail? Or yeah, I could lick them all together. You could use a gator clip. And, you know, should I like, like, and should I like have like have a donut, you know, sort of like bring a treat with it? Or know. is that too much? I don't know. And I can't, I don't know. Once you decide though, I, I would ask about 30 people and see what they think. I, I don't know what to do. I don't know what's going on. You know what your problem is? What? It's Second Guest Thursday. Second Guest Thursday? No! That's, that's a, every Thursday where you can't trust any of your instincts. That's why when I was just in the bathroom, I didn't yeah. know whether to go one or two. Uh, I couldn't make up my mind. I know. You don't know. So I just came back, uh, and I, this, I'm in pain. This morning, I felt like I had a headache, but I wasn't sure. <laughs> Second guess Thursday. <laughs> and I just spent like 20 minutes at the vending machine because I didn't know whether to get the little gym uh, chocolate I teen uh, or the little gym so with powdered sugar. I know. Or, or I should get ding-dongs or ho-hos. It's sad to see a college graduate in this way. <laughs> Second guess Thursday, I oh. can't stand it. How can our careers go any farther? But you know what's coming up? What? I don't care Friday. <laughs> <laughs> so what'd you all think? Other than it's hilarious, right? In the moment we realized when I said something, we probably shouldn't have said like, uh, like it was a like attack, passive, like a little dig, right? I, I mean, that comment seemed very 
on task. I don't know if it was intended for our group, but yes, agreed. And there are things that we say in the moment that may or may not be conducive to someone that's experiencing anxiety. I got a comment, this is second guess Thursday, Monday, Wednesday, what is it, Saturday? Yeah, right? And one of the reasons I like this video is because it recognizes the fact that anxiety does not discriminate. And by that, I mean that it doesn't care literally what your colors are or your race, your ethnicity, whether you're green or pink, or if you're college educated or not. Anxiety can affect anyone. And even though Hoops and Yo-Yo are both highly educated professionals that probably could differentiate between whether or not to put a staple or a paper clip or um, a claw to keep their papers together, when they were under that moment of stress, they just can't make any decisions. And I think that's something we all can relate to. And we see it with, oh, I'm so short. We see it with students all the time where they just become so overwhelmed and over consumed by stress that they just stop, right? They don't do their work, they can't do their work and they become at an impasse. They're not really doing anything because they just can't. They're just so over consumed by this surmounting anxiety or stress they're experiencing. And then what happens is they do nothing about it. And while I did not do well in physics in high school or college, one of the things that I remind kids is, you know, an object in motion stays in motion unless there's a different force that's impacting on that object. And so things are not gonna get better if you don't do something to get make it better, right? And so we have to empower students and adults to create change in their lives. And part of that is because if you have the ability to invoke and create your own change, you're not gonna rely on someone else to save you and it allows you to realize the power you have within yourself. That's not to say that there aren't times when we all need help. Obviously I'd be out of a job if I told people that they don't need assistance from someone else, but we can talk about the different times and when to ask for help and when not to, and when to tackle things independently. So what is stress, right? You can see I've been doing this for a long time. <laughs> My first citation was 2009. Um, stress is the body's response to emotional and mental challenges or pressures and our demand that they experience. And it's this feeling of emotional or physical tension. How many of you, like me, if you're under stress or you're under tension, you feel it in your muscles, um, you lose your neck because your muscles become so tight and so stressed. And you realize that you're spending more time and more energy just trying to stretch and relax because you've got so much tension, right? Or you carry it in your jawline and you get TMJ or you get headaches. Stress is also wear and tear on our body as we adjust to change. And I think that's very important to remember because we have this negative connotation, especially in um, Western culture and American US dominated cultures where we think of stress as bad. In fact, we often think of change as bad. When the reality is, is stress happens and there is gonna be wear and tear on our bodies. and we're going to talk about how stress can be either adaptive or maladaptive, both depending on the situation, our mindset, and what we do about it. Stress can come from any situation, from any event or thought that makes you feel frustrated, angry, or nervous, right? What are some things that cause you all stress? Anyone want to share? Helping my kid with calculus homework. Helping your kid with homework, running late, yes. I would say running late causes me stress and I do absolutely nothing about it. I think it's also important to recognize that what causes one person stress is not gonna be the same that causes another person stress, right? And like I said, I'm one of those people that get stressed out when I'm running late and I get stressed out in traffic and yet I do nothing about it. Nothing about it, absolutely nothing. But then there's other situations where people would expect that they cause me stress and it doesn't. And so stress is a very individualized experience, which is different from anxiety. So anxiety is by definition, a diagnostic classification. And as I mentioned in psychology, we are awful at naming things with symptoms of things, but there's different types of anxiety disorders. And I think 
one of the things we remind both parents and students and just the general public is that people might suffer from anxiety from time to time, but that doesn't necessarily equate to a clinical disorder. You know, you're going to have to be mindful of things like severity, intensity, duration, symptomology, et cetera. But because anxiety is so prolific and it's one of the more common disorders, most people are familiar with it. And there seems to be the groups of people that are in complete denial that their anxiety is pathological versus those that feel that their anxiety is all consuming and pathological. And people seem to fall in one or two categories, one or the other. Um, so in terms of anxiety, obviously there's panic disorders, there's specific phobias, there's generalized anxiety, sort of the catch-all, there's social anxiety, et cetera. So the next thing to keep in mind, and I think this is important to recognize, is stress is a normal feeling. I don't receive this as frequently as I did when I worked in other parts of the country, but I used to get prescription notes all the time from doctors that would say, X, Y, and Z are under stress, please remove stress, please take stress out of life, et cetera. And that is like a stopgap measure that is not effective because stress is inevitable. And what we need to be doing is to teach people how to cope with such. But the reality is we as a public education system go tend to fluctuate between focusing on academics and then focusing on social emotional and focusing on academics and then focusing on social emotional. And rarely are we doing things side by side when the reality is skills do have to be taught. And that includes skills like learning to manage stress and having socio emotional competencies. And so I think we're getting back to that point and recognizing that we have to be teaching people to do more than just reading, writing, and math. But in terms of stress, there are two kinds. There's going to be your short-term acute stress, and then there's your long-term chronic stress. And so short-term acute stress, stress is just that. It's stress that's short-lasting, short-acting, and it is resulting in a reaction to an immediate threat. Now, the word threat, remember, doesn't have to necessarily be danger or devastation, but the point of the word is you've got something, a stimulus that's causing a reaction, and that stimulus is that threat. And so things like tests and quizzes and homework are examples of acute stressors, or walking into the wrong classroom because of A day, B day, one day, two day, texting the wrong person. Teenagers in particular experience stress very differently than adolescents, or than, I'm sorry, than their parents do. And then there's things like chronic stress and chronic stress is ongoing stress or ongoing threats. And those typically result in stagnancy. And so we don't move, we don't progress from it. And so one of the biggest stressors that I see is students taking courses that are either too advanced or that they're not prepared for. And then parents tell me that, well, it was recommended because they're gonna gain all these skills and they will, but there's sometimes a cost to those classes. And so there's a difference between rigor and challenge being motivating and invigorating and positive and being negative to the detriment of the student's mental health and all their other classes. Drug and alcohol use, they can start as an acute reaction to a stressor, but they can result in chronic stress. Learning disabilities, mental illness, bullying, ongoing peer pressure, you know, parental marital conflicts, abuse, neglect, all of those are chronic stressors that lead to being chronically stressed. And chronic stress is one of the biggest killers that we have in this country. And then as we're all experiencing pandemics or endemics or whatever you want to refer to this as, has become a chronic stressor. I, I hate to dwell on this, but remember back March, 2020, when everyone went home for a couple of weeks thinking that's all it was going to be? Yeah, it's been the longest two weeks of any of our lives, right? This is definitely a chronic stressor. And it's resulted in additional chronic stressors. There's concerns with the economy, there's concerns with health, there's concerns with increased mental health crises in this country, et cetera. Which do you think our bodies are adept at handling? Acute stressors or chronic stressors? Right acute. And the comment earlier that it causes stress when you realize you need to teach your kids these and they're things that we were never taught. I completely agree. 
So what is the problem? Well, this is the problem, as you will see. So I usually stop this video because at the end it becomes a little bit more adult than I want to go into with teenagers. But, you know, dancing, tearing up paper, popping bubble wrap, oops, I didn't mean to start again, are ways to manage stress. And one of the things that we find in the unfortunate truth is it's not generally the actual stressor, except for a few circumstances that determines whether stress becomes acute or chronic, but how we manage it, how we respond to that stressor. Obviously situations like economic poverty and disabilities and abuse are going to be more likely to be chronic just by virtue of the circumstance. But a lot of times what happens with young people in particular is acute stressors become chronic because they're not responding to them in an adaptive manner. So why do teens feel stress, right? Teens might feel stress because of things going on at home. They might feel stress because of peer pressure or dating abuse or injuries or appearance. Social media becomes a big one with young people and then they can't turn it off or phone notifications, right? I know for myself, I'm one of those people. If I get an email notification, I have to respond right away. And if I don't, it causes me stress. So the way I manage my stress is by responding to those notifications and getting rid of them because then I feel productive, right? But how many people become controlled by their technology and their notifications? And I know we as adults do it and we're not the best model, but it always concerns me when I'm in classrooms observing and teachers are teaching and I watch the kids and the teens and they are just constantly responding to notifications on their phone. And it's like, oh my goodness, there is no way you're engaged in what's going on. You know, and it absolutely can be hard to unplug. Teens in particular that are so used to being connected to their phones 
when their phones are down or their phone battery dies. Oh my gosh, my, uh, my own teens. It's like when the, I had fosters and when the teens cell phone dies, it's like the end of the world, total meltdown, right? You have teens that go through that. Other things that cause teen stress. I wanna, I wanna go back. Can you think of other things that cause your teens or your children or your self stress? Anyone? I have seen um, <laughs> little notes that losing the head of a Lego figure causes stress, bedtime causes stress, Spanish class causes stress and just getting to school causes stress. So mm -hmm. yeah, a lot of stressors for a yeah. first grader. I can understand that. Any other input? One of my favorite things that teens in particular say is stress causes me stress. <laughs> that is an excellent description of nothing, but thank you for sharing that. So hey. Also, there's Sorry, some more, there's some more in the chat, Amy. Um, go for it. Fears of things like dogs, um, getting kids to do college applications on time, little children, um, personality clashes with family, weather, thunder, lightning, having teachers not follow IEPs, um, younger brothers getting into kids' stuff, sibling rivalry. Oh, there's a lot here. Yeah. Yeah. Lots of sibling rivalry. Yes. Anyway, late payments. <laughs> yeah not being able to make payments. Yeah, I get it. So I like the zebra stress. So how do people respond to stress? And I'm just going to put it bluntly and say, by and large, we respond to stress pretty poorly, in part because people don't think about managing stress until it's too late. And so one of the things that I often hear from both, you know, and I think we all become victims of this is, well, I was seeing a therapist, but then things were going better. So I stopped seeing them. And it's like, well, they, they might have been going better, but they may have also been going better because you were actively addressing what was causing the difficulty and working to solve those problems. But then also as a mental health provider, my argument is everyone can benefit from talk therapy, but there are times in our lives when we need it. And especially with our high achieving students and um, many adults, when we least have the time to devote to self-care is when we most need self-care, right? But people respond to stress through a number of ways. So they might act out, they might withdraw, they might lie, they might not get out of bed, they might sleep too long, they might not be able to sleep, they might resort to drugs or self-injury or suicidal ideation or physical complaints or missed school, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The list just goes on and on. And I think oftentimes when I'm talking to teens or parents um, and families that are under stress or families that have anxiety disorders within the family or burgeoning anxiety concerns, we'll often hear, well, I didn't know that she or he or they were anxious because they didn't look anxious, right? Well, what does that look like? The reality is, is anxiety is an internalizing behavior or condition. And so what we often see is the manifestation of anxiety. And for many people, the way they manage anxiety is by masking it and avoiding situations that are anxiety producing. So outsiders don't see the ramifications of it. So why do we experience stress? What's the purpose of it? All right, well, I'll journey with you on story time. So survival motivation, there we go. Now we're popping with those answers. So I think we have to recognize, regardless of your evolutionary beliefs, Physically and physiologically, we're not all that different from the days of the cave people. And so when a threat was perceived for cave people, their endorphins raised, their blood pushed through their heart into their veins, their muscles, and it gave them strength to outrun their predators, right? And so 
the reality is physiologically, your body is going to respond to stress in the same way, whether that stressor is a wildebeest or whether that stressor is a quiz or miss curfew or being late for traffic. And so it's up to our brains to tell our body whether or not the threat is dangerous or chronic or concerning and to use you know, metacognition and think about what that stressor is and the danger they're in and help us to determine adaptively how we should cope with such, right? And so when I'm talking to teenagers about this, I ask them, what are some stressors that cave people may have experienced? And so they talk about having to either run from prey or conquer prey to feed your family, for clothing, for warmth, for shelter, et cetera. And so we talk about, as depicted in this picture, when that wildebeest is chasing you, what's gonna happen is different things. And so your eyes, your pupils are gonna dilate to let in more light. So adaptively, you're more aware of visual sensory input and your ears are gonna be more attuned to sound because even if you're looking at one wildebeest in front of you, that doesn't mean there's not a wildebeest behind you, right? And as I mentioned, your muscles are gonna engorge because your heart's gonna be pumping faster. And so your muscles are gonna engorge with blood, which is gonna give you greater strength, greater endurance, greater speed. You're gonna be able to run higher, jump faster and for longer periods of time. And then the hair on your arms is physically gonna stand up to give the um, appearance evolutionarily that you're larger than you are right? It's supposed to make you look bigger. And then what are some other things that happen? Your breathing is going to change. You're going to need more oxygen in your lungs in order to have your muscles um, fill with oxygen and have that greater strength and endurance and speed that you need in order to survive this foe, this predator, right? And as I already mentioned, your brain is the one who determines whether or not it's a wildebeest chasing you or a wildebeest in front of you or a threat that you can conquer. But what happens is when your body is physiologically going through those emotional and physiological reactions to stress, and so you're hyperventilating and your heart is pounding and you have tremendous sensory input, we often don't have the same rational thought that we did before that test was put in front of us or before that wildebeest was chasing us. And so it becomes this paradox. So what do you do with it, right? So one of the things we have to do is psychoeducation. You know, as was mentioned earlier, we don't and we need to teach people how to manage stress and what stress is and how to cope with it because it's inevitable. It's gonna happen in our lives. And I wish I could tell people that this stressful situation that you're experiencing will be the last one, but that would be lying. You, you know, you might literally experience another stressor two seconds later. Some of it is going to depend on your perspective of it and your ability to cope. And the disastrous irony of it is the less coping skills that you have, the more stressors you're going to experience because you're not going to cope with those well. And then the more likely to become chronic instead of the acute intended stressor. So does anyone recognize this cute little guy from a Disney exhibit when I was a kid? I want to say it was like the early 90s, but it may have been earlier than that. It was from MetLife and Epcot in the Cranium Command. And I remember this as a kid going in and seeing it. And so basically what it is, is these were these audio animatronics. And this whole exhibit, because it was MetLife, was about the human body and health. And so what happened is in this exhibit, these army recruits, I think it was army, were to pilot different brains. And so this little man, this little person, this army recruit got to pilot like an 11 year old boy. And the thought was, well, it's a kid, it's easier, et cetera. And so the, the audio animatronic, the, it's not really a ride, but the show goes through what life is like in this kid's brain. And so the first thing that happens is the eyes open because the alarm's going off. And so you see smoke going through all the different chambers in this um, exhibit. And you hear Hans and Franz from SNL, they're pumping the blood and they're like, what's going on? What's going on? What are the alarms? And like the smoke is going off and there's sirens, et cetera. And this recruit has no idea what to do. 
And then the next thing you know, this little kid, this 11 year old has run out completely butt naked and his little sister screams at him because he's not dressed, right? And so the commander who's responsible for this recruit is like, what are you doing? Get control of this. Like literally you are in charge of manning this person's brain and you're not doing a good job. And so the recruit learns that there's good stress and there's bad stress and it doesn't matter beans to your body if your brain doesn't interpret that stressor and know whether or not to let it help, how to help it work for you instead of against you. And I think it's really important to conceptualize that because there are good things that can come out of stress. And so stress can make you feel energized and motivated and it can encourage you to deal with challenges. You know, we've seen those super, super human feats where someone's sees a toddler or an infant that's like on the edge of, you know, getting hit by a car and someone who's not usually a runner is able to run in and swoop that kid up and save them, right? Without stress and cortisol reactions, that would not have happened. And then there's other instances. Sometimes coaches <laughs> will psych players up before a big game, knowing that if we increase their levels, their cortisol levels, they're going to perform better in that moment. And sometimes, you know, before you have an audition, it can be effective. And sometimes it's motivating before a test. But the reality is that good stress and could become a bad situation if you're not interpreting it correctly or adaptively and it becomes maladaptive. And the reality is whether we think we can't function or we can't function, the end result is the same. And so when our own coping mechanisms are overcome by stress, we either do not and cannot function at our best. And the same comes from if we believe we can't. If we don't think we can handle the situation, we're not going to be able to handle it. We talk ourselves out of it. But the reality is, again, our body is going to respond to stress in the same way. And when that stress is not acute, the body physiologically can't sustain itself. And so what we see are we see kids that experience, you know, the senior stress, uh, what do they call it? Senioritis, right? So by the end of the year, they just don't care anymore. Or they've worked themselves so hard throughout the year, they're just exhausted. Or we see physiological effects of it where people are more likely to have colds. They're more likely to be sick because they've had chronic stress. They haven't managed that stress. It's become ongoing. And we know that the most common reason people seek medical care is due to a psychological difficulty that's causing it. So it's hard to see, but hopefully my animation works. I put up here three and I crossed it out because the reality, there's actually four reactions that we can have to fear. We think about these three, which are fight, flight, and freeze. Does anyone know what the fourth reaction is? On. Huh? I don't Bond. know what you said. On? Can you spell it? Fawn. Okay. Whoa. My animation did not work. Why is it not going? Oh, this is so da disastrous. Apparently, I don't know how to use PowerPoint in 2022. But the fourth reaction, which you'll see a little picture of later, was an image of Neo from the Matrix, where he's standing here and he's facing everything. Because the fourth reaction to fear is actually facing. That's what I was going to say. Yay! That's awesome because we don't teach people about face. We teach them about freeze, we teach them about flight, and we teach them about fight. So there's four reactions to fear and there's also four reactions to stress and challenges. So fight, which manifests as anger, flight, which results in denial or escape. I'm gonna skip facing for a second. And then the fourth reaction is freezing or shutting down. And what happens more often than not is people fight, flight, or freeze, but they don't face. And so examples of fighting, there are situations where fighting is an appropriate response. 
And so a threat, when a threat can and should be physically conquered or it's needed for survival, fight is a great method. And so fighting can be things like posturing, having a verbal outburst or a confrontation or insulting or blaming. And you know, I don't wanna teach students that fighting is always maladaptive because there are some instances where fighting is appropriate, right? So there are times when fighting is appropriate. So if you are being physically threatened and you're in danger or you need to posture as a means of demonstrating your prowess in order to protect yourself, absolutely, fight is the way to go. More often than not, students use flight. And so flight is either escape or denial. And so we often see this with young people where you know a parent will come in and be like, how come you are not doing any homework? And the student will either say, I have no homework to do or give a million excuses as to why the homework is not taking place. And so what they're doing is they're escaping that situation by denying it exists. So I don't have homework, right? Or it could be physically moving away from it, whether it's flight in terms of not walking into the school building because school causes stress or skipping school or going home. That's all examples of flight. And so it's physically moving away from something or metacognitively or emotionally disassociating so you don't have to think about it. How many people do that with their bills? The bill comes in and you're like, nope, I don't wanna think about this. I'm gonna pretend it doesn't exist. And maybe that's why we have those late bills, right? Or we hide. Students will come in my office when they're overstimulated sensorily and they will literally hide under my desk. And so they're literally escaping everything that's stressing them out. Or people might shrink. If we're in a confrontational situation, sometimes people feel overpowered and they will shrink, which is their way of escaping from that situation. Or we often see young people that will sabotage. They will avoid or omit, oh, I don't have homework, or it's not that big of a deal, I can do it later. And so they procrastinate and procrastinate and procrastinate, and then they're over-consumed by that stressor and the anxiety, and then they can't cope with it, and then they end up flighting again because they can't go to school the next day. And then the last thing, we often conflate flighting and freezing, but we sometimes there are times to shut down. And when it, again, there are times adaptively when it's appropriate to shut, shut down and physically freeze or when you're, but then there's also situations where it's not helpful. The one time that freezing is appropriate is when there's no way to avoid harm and we can't conquer that foe through fighting or through, and we can't escape it through flight. And so there might be situations, like they talk about um, if you're in the woods and certain animals approach you, some animals it's better to freeze and so the animal doesn't notice you. And then there's other situations where they expect you to look like you're larger than life in order to be more intimidated. And sometimes people freeze in a manner that's maladaptive. And so they're just utterly consumed by emotion and they're feeling completely helpless. And then there's other times that people justify and rationalize that they had to shut down or why they shut down and it might not have been a rational approach. The reality is, is that, and I don't know a percentage, but I'll make one up, 85 to 95% of the time, most challenges can be faced, which is connecting with that threat. And so when a threat can be mitigated, our best course of action is to face it and to deal with it because flight does not make the problem go away. Freezing does not make the problem go away. You know, the problem's still there. We're just either pretending it doesn't exist or we're running from it. And so most of the time, our best advantage is to mitigate it and persevere, to see the situation rationally and to respond calmly. The problem is when we're in fight, flight, or freeze, we're not responding often calmly. We talked about some of the ways, reasons that young people here feel stress and some of the maladaptive ways that they cope with it, but there's also effects of prolonged stress that are disastrous on our bodies. And so they can have, you can have impaired memory, you can have exhaustion, you can have insomnia, you can overeat, undereat, not wanting to eat, not having time to eat, not having time for self-care. If you have young people or adults in your life where they're under a lot of pressure and the way they manage their 
aggression and their anger and their stress level is by verbally fighting. And so you ask them, can you just take a break? And either your teen or your spouse says, I can't take a break. I need to do this, right? Maybe they might, you know, it's not necessarily maladaptive to manage your stress by persevering on a task. However, are you really getting much done if you're in that high of an emotional uh, stress, right? And I mentioned that one of the top reasons people seek medical care is due to underlying emotional difficulties and the effects of stress. Does anyone know what medical profession is among the first to see evidence of stress? Heart doctors. Maybe, what else? Oh, we got a right answer. Dentists. Why do you say dentists? Dentists are correct. Why do people, uh, grinding teeth, jaw clenching, TMJ, all correct answers. The other reason is because dentists, people usually see twice a year. Often, unless you're sick, you only see a doctor once a year. Sometimes people don't see a doctor at all, a medical doctor. Cardiologists might see the effect of stress. Psychiatrists might see the effects of stress, but people don't go to those doctors on a routine basis. And so that's one of the reasons dentists are the first ones to recognize levels of stress. The other thing is stress has a lot of effects on your body chemistry and, you know, even on your, the gases and stuff in your stomach and you have more acid. And so it wears down the teeth enamel. I have no teeth enamel left. <laughs> so if I tell you how I manage stress, probably not well, right? Also, it results in gum disease and gum erosion. But also, yes, the tight jaw and the clenched teeth and the grinding. Apparently you're supposed to have ridges in your teeth that protect you from cavities, right? Yes, I have a mouth guard and I wear it. I need to wear it during the day too, though, but I'm working on it. I'm not just a client, or not just a president, I'm also a client. There are also factors that help to prevent the negative effects of stress. And if we were to summarize them, they would be things like stress management. And so positive coping skills, having consistent and positive expected discipline. Believe it or not, facing a negative punitive consequence is not a detriment to being able to manage your stress, not knowing what the consequences of your actions are and being surprised by them or having consequences constantly change, that's what is maladaptive. Being able to express your feelings appropriately and accurately is a way to mitigate the negative effects of stress. One of the things I think we need to start with young children is teaching them words to explain what they're feeling. And often people resort to angry, sad, scared, happy, but there's so many other feeling words. And if we don't empower kids and young adults and adults with the vocabulary to describe how they're feeling, how are they gonna communicate that feeling? How are they gonna get help? Having good nutrition and exercise are good ways to mitigate stress. And as we mentioned, unfortunately, self-care is one of the first things to go when people are under stress, when the reality is we need that self-care even more during those times. Taking time to relax and do recreational activities, having a predictable and manageable schedule. How many of you or your teens or your kids are ridiculously overscheduled and that becomes stressful as you're trying to run people to a million places? I know I have a six-year-old niece and she comes over to my house and she says, it's her sanctuary. It's her sanctuary. And one of the reasons for that is because she says, I'm just chill, which is ironic because I am overscheduled myself. But when it comes to doing stuff with her, I don't overschedule her day. And so we can just move from one activity to another within the house and we have nowhere we have to go. And she loves it because it's so relaxing to her. She's like, I can just be me, right? And yes, I can recommend, and yes, I will share resources, et cetera. And then having expected routines, even for ourselves. If we have expected routines, 
that are even the simplest things like keeping your car keys in the same place every day, that can help to mitigate negative effects of stress. I already talked about having a predictable schedule. Another thing is adjusting sensory input during periods of stress. I mentioned that sometimes when kids are stressed out or when they're experiencing sensory overload, they will come in my office and just sit under my desk, right? So as you can, you might be able to tell, I don't turn my lights on because fluorescent lights are awful and they're not good for sensory input. And so I have lamps around my office. And students that are feeling stressed will come in and just feel at peace from that because it's quiet and there's low lighting because high levels of light are not good when you're trying to relax and deescalate, especially these awful fluorescent medical lights that we have. Another thing to keep in mind is that we talk about how we do things instinctively. So if you were to be a six foot tall person and you came upon a young person that was lost, what would you do? The first thing you probably do is to crouch down so you're on their level. And one of the reasons we do that is because we are adjusting our physical presence to be less intimidating to that person. And so even though I'm four foot 11 and a half, I do the same thing regardless of the height of the person I'm talking to. So when I'm approaching someone that's in the middle of a panic attack or when someone's stressed out, I do the same thing. I crouch down and I lower my voice because the worst thing to do is overpower someone who's already feeling overpowered. We can capitalize on people's strengths or put things into perspective or use grounding for sensory input. And this right here, oh, why does it do that? I'll show you in a minute. One of my favorite tools for teaching people about stress is from Pinterest. Let's see. And I think I've Googled it so much that it comes up when you Google this, but I think I have to change what screen I'm sharing. So new share this and I'll put this in the notes as well. So this is coping skills and it breaks it down into different categories because the reality is, is that everyone needs an entire toolbox of coping skills because whether you have a hammer or a nail, or I'm sorry, a hammer or a screwdriver, both are effective tools, but depending on whether you have a nail or a screw, they're gonna work in different situations. And so it breaks it down into different kinds of coping and then positives and negatives that go along with it. And I remind young people that by definition, it's not a coping skill if it's not helping you cope. And so sometimes we gotta try something else because the notion that coping skills don't work is inaccurate. It means that maybe you've been using the wrong ones in the wrong situation. And then recognizing the circle of control, which I'll also attach, which is basically just that. Most of the time, anxiety and overwhelming stress is caused by trying to manage things that are not within our power to manage. And so by focusing our energy and our attention on things that we don't have control over. Rhythmic breathing. Remembering it's okay to not feel okay, but reminding ourselves that they're going to be okay. Allowing time for recentering, using mindfulness and meditation. And then this is the last video, and it's being with all your experiences, and it's a great stress reduction video. Disappointment and pain. Like most people, you might prefer to avoid unwanted thoughts, feelings, and physical sensations, especially if they are intense or overwhelming. Imagine your unwanted feelings as a beach ball that doesn't go away. You might try different things to pretend the ball doesn't exist, but when you throw it away, it bounces back. And when you move away from it, it follows you. Maybe you try to get rid of this beach ball by pushing it underwater. You manage to keep it out of sight, but if you let go, the beach ball shoots right back up to the surface. So, you decide to keep holding the beach ball underwater. It's a lot of hard work. Think about how much energy it takes to keep the ball down and what you might be missing without realizing it. What would happen if you let the beach ball just be there? Or maybe even tried sitting with the beach ball for a while. 
Instead of actively ignoring the ball or pushing it underwater, what if you chose to direct your energy instead towards activities and people that are important to you, whether the ball is there or not? Allowing unwanted thoughts, feelings, or physical sensations to be there doesn't mean you have to like them. It means that you are choosing to devote your energy towards the people and things that are important to you. Say your friends want to play a game, but you're feeling anxious or have pain in your stomach. Maybe you can't play the full game with your friends, but you can still keep score or cheer them on. Sometimes it's fun to just be around your friends, even if you can't participate. Some unwanted thoughts, feelings, and physical sensations may never fully go away, but you don't have to devote your energy to suppressing or avoiding them. You can still be involved in activities, even if you need to pace yourself or take breaks now and then. Unwanted experiences are part of life for all of us, no matter who we are. It might take some effort and creativity, but even the smallest steps towards allowing your unwanted emotions and physical sensations to just be there can help you do the things that matter to you and let you live a fuller and more meaningful life. I especially like that video because we often deny people's problems, which never makes them feel any better about them. So when do you get help? I remind people that if you're feeling agitated for more than two minutes, that's a time that you need to get help. And think about it. If your heart is racing and you're having difficulty breathing for more than two minutes, that is like an eternity. Obviously, if you're self-injuring or threatening self-injury, it's time to get help. And if you have thoughts of suicide, it's time to get help. Are there any questions? <laughs>